difícil. Ask council to approach. You may be seated. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The time. Please stand so I can swear you over today. Do you swear for to tell the truth and nothing but the truth on the penalty I do, Your Honor. Thank you. And just for the record, please state your name. Uh, Jeffrey Thomas Stone. You may proceed, Ms. McGinn. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Um, let's go back to where we were yesterday. Um, I think we had just been talking about the field um, officers um, and uh, off the CIT officer Monet, and just for the jury, uh, for the jury, for the mind of the jury, uh, did you identify uh, the CIT officer Monet who was negotiating with Mr. Boyd as states 27A in the hell and sunglasses? Yes. Um, where was he sent after he was pulled off negotiating with Mr. Boyd? Um, 
I believe he was uh, sent to a perimeter position. Okay. Um, and can you explain to the jury the perimeter again, please? Um, yes. Once uh, when tactical officers show up and they pull the field officers to a perimeter, um, you're going to have kind of an, an outer ring around where the, uh, the the area in question is, which in this point was James Boyd's camp. So kind of the uh, um, the outer the outer ring of where James Boyd was standing is what we call the perimeter. And that's where the uh, field officers were stationed kind of in a loose uh, 360 uh, circle around him. Okay. And let's refresh your recollection. Um, to, if you don't, do you remember exactly where he was? No, I don't. Did you, after uh, you completed your investigation, actually do diagrams to indicate where all the officers were at the time of the shooting? Um, yes, and it was based on um, sketches that have been received from the officers during their interviews. Okay, each, each one did a separate sketch? Yes. And you figured out where everybody was at the time of the shooting? I did. Okay, but refresh your, refresh your recollection to show you uh, a diagram. Yes. Let me show you what's remarked to Stacey. He's at 17B. And can you tell, um, does that refresh your recollection on where um, uh, CIT officer Monet was sent? Yes, it does. Can you tell the jury where he was sent? Uh, down by that, uh, kind of that, that large tree at the bottom of the, uh, of the uh, picture along the main trail right there. So just west of uh, where James Boyd was located. Now there was a second CIT officer there. Yes. Brock Nipreth, who I think you identified yesterday as um, State Exhibit 26A. Yes. Um, and was he sent away from the area of negotiations with Mr. Boyd? Uh, yes, he was. W where was he sent? He was sent. Uh, North uh, along the northern perimeter with uh, K-9 officer Kenneth Ronzone. Okay, so if you look at the, the diagram that we saw yesterday, he's over here on this. Sure, All right, let me just pull this out here. That's correct. Okay, and this is a closer version of the U mount that we showed earlier. Is that right? Uh, it appears to be yes. I have a question. Uh, I have a question. Yes, Judge. I could not see yesterday when you were pointing out direction, and I need to have you hold that up. Okay. I just want to verify that the bottom of that photograph is west and the top is east. If you see in the upper right hand corner the north seeking arrow, is that way the little circle? Yeah. So north is this way, so okay. east is up, west is down, south to the right, north to the left. Okay, thank you. Okay, and you had offered it? Yes, I did. Offered Any objection 72. to 72? I just don't understand the top of it. Maybe you can explain it. See how it's cut off? It's okay, That's, right. Why is the top card cut off? Um, it looks like it's different. It's... I'm sorry, I'm yeah. No, no, well, I didn't say that you could want the the witness. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't know. <laughs> So I if Ms. McGinn, I don't sure. understand the picture. So let's sure. Ms. McGinn ask some further In order questions. to orient the jury to this picture, um, did we put something in to make to show the top of the U mound? Uh, yes, it appears so. Okay. And what is this little part up here? 
Uh, that looks, that appears to be the top of U Mount. Okay. And that's just to orient them, this isn't how the scene actually looks? Uh, well, no, because the bottom part here uh, where the cutoff portion is, that's an aerial photo and that appears to be kind of a photo taken from someone. Okay, great. Uh, may I, I move 72 to I object because apparently it's a combination of two photos and he didn't do both of them, so I, it's just as confusing. Okay. Um, Mr. Robles, any objection? 72 is admitted. Okay. Can you come down, Detective Stone, and we'll show the jury when you're supposed to have it? Yes. Do you, do you want to bring your, your um, the thing that you used to refresh your recollection of everybody wanted? the shooting, did the um, rope team people begin asking to send CIT officers? Objection to the question, they, not specifically about who. Uh, she's going to ask for a hearsay. Speaking. Know specifically which officer it is. Speaking. Okay. Um, was there a call put out in the last half, uh, or, or about the last half hour before the shooting, asking for dispatch to send CIT officers? I do recall something like that. Um, I don't remember it coming from the rope team or anyone from the rope team. Um, I recall K-9 officer, officer Weimerskirch asking about it, I believe. Okay, so let me ask you about that. If they already had two CIT officers on site, why didn't they know that? Uh, I don't know. Okay. Did, in the interviews that were conducted, did um, either Defendant Sandy or Defendant Weimerskirch ever indicate that before they sent the CIT officers away, that they debriefed them to find out what they'd been doing or who they were? Um, I'd have to refresh my memory with the interviews. Okay. Do you remember anything like that? Um, specifically them talking to the CIT officers? Correct. I don't remember that. All right. Um, at some point, uh, was there an officer that I think that you identified yesterday who had a, a, a beanbag shotgun? Objection, lady. Was there an officer who had a beanbag shotgun and was leading us? That question is not leading. Right. Uh, there were two, uh, ultimately th three. Okay, and I'm, ta and I'm sorry, my question was bad. Be before the SWAT team arrived, was there an officer already on scene with a beanbag shotgun? There were two. Okay, and which two officers were those? Um, so the, uh, in the uh, initial response from the field officers after the open space officers were already there, uh, Sergeant Carpenter and Justin Rogelio uh, deployed up the mountain with their beanbag shotguns. Christopher Wetterlin was with them. However, while walking up the hill, um, Sergeant Carpenter, because he was the supervisor on scene, passed his beanbag off to Christopher Wetterlin so he could perform supervisor duties. Okay, and why do you pass off a device like that when you have another duty to perform? Um, 
because with the sergeant's responsibilities, uh, oftentimes they will have to step back from, uh, say, the, the negotiation, and they're the ones that uh, will get on the radio to request um, additional services, like when uh, Sergeant Carpenter requested K-9 over the radio. Um, he may have to get on the phone with radio uh, to, to uh, make additional requests or get on the phone with other supervisors, so he can't be tied up with the beanbag shotgun. That's correct. And the person who passed off the beanbag shotgun to was Officer Wetterland, who was 28A? Yes. And then you said there was somebody else who had a beanbag shotgun up there before before um, the road team arrived. I think those were the only two. Okay. Um, all right. And so um, there was a picture that we showed um, yesterday. This picture yesterday. Yes. Um, can you can you tell me what kind of weapon that uh, I think you identified that as Officer Wetterland? That's seven C four. Seven C four. I'm sorry, Judge. Seven C four. Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, what kind of weapon is he holding in that picture before the rope team arrives? Uh, yes, yeah, so this is Christopher Wetterland, like I uh, described yesterday, and the, the weapon that he has right there is the uh, less lethal beanbag shotgun. Okay, and I don't remember, Detective Stone, do we explain how the less lethal beanbag shotgun works? Um, I don't believe I described that yesterday. Can you explain to the jury how that, that particular less lethal weapon works? So uh, the beanbag shotgun is an actual shotgun. Um, it's, it's not any kind of specialized shotgun uh, different from uh, any other 870, Remington 870 that is issued to a, a police officer. What's unique about the beanbag shotgun, though, is um, uh, they take these shotguns and they, they put markings on them, which is yellow tape, to indicate that they are beanbag shotguns. And the reason for that, and officers are trained uh, in this, is that once those markings are on that shotgun, um, it, is, it no longer serves as an actual shotgun with lethal ammunition. So you're never to ever load it with uh, lethal ammunition ever again. So instead, what you load it with is a shotgun shell that has a yellow beanbag projectile, and it's a circular projectile about this big, and on the uh, attached to it is a uh, several mesh stabilizers. So when you actually fire the beanbag shotgun, this projectile, um, the beanbag itself, will uh, shoot out the barrel and it will strike whatever target that you are aiming at. Can you describe when you say it's about this big? How big you uh, a golf ball. Thank okay. You. Good um, and um, when they uh, were up here at this point, at some point did they tell Mr. Boyd, if you cross this line, we're going to shoot you with this beanbag shotgun? Yes. Okay. And, and what did he do in response to that instruction? Um, you couldn't really see what he uh, does on the video. Um, Do you know from the statements that they say he didn't cross the line after they said that to him? What do you know from the statements about his response to that command? Based on hearsay. You can answer. Um, based on their statements, uh, he never did cross whatever line that they were referring to. Okay. Um, about 30 minutes before the shooting, did they put out a call for a beanbag shotgun? Officer Scott Weimerskirch um, realized that they did not have a beanbag with them at that time, so he did request, um, he says, an impact weapon and then refers to a beanbag, yes. Okay. Why is it they didn't know that there were already two beanbag shotguns out there? Um, well, I th again, I don't know why um, they didn't. I, I mean, I can only speculate if you want me to answer that. Oh, no, I don't want you to... Speculation, Your Honor. I don't want him to speculate, Judge. Um, is part of your training that when you have a scene like this involving multiple officers, uh, well, what is your training about whether it's important to communicate with each other about what resources are there at the scene? Uh, it's very important to communicate what resources you have and where your people are um, situated. Ken, if you are the person making decisions like a sergeant or, or the person in charge of the scene, what is your responsibility for finding out what resources you have available? Um, that's one of your main responsibilities uh, when, like if you're going en route to a, an initial call, 
uh, the sergeant will put out over the air, um, I need someone with a beanbag, I need someone with a taser, um, uh, I need someone with a 40 millimeter uh, less lethal. Uh, so it is, I mean, it, it's not solely the responsibility of the supervisor. Um, it's kind of the responsibility of all officers to keep that in mind. Um, if there isn't a supervisor around to say, hey, we don't have a beanbag, um, and get on the air and say, I need a beanbag. Oh, okay. And w was Officer Wetterbloom the fellow with the beanbag still there? Uh, they were, the, everyone was still on scene. Okay. And Captain, we'd have to have you do this again. Can you show the jury just generally? where Officer Wetterland had been sent after the rope team came up there. Yes, uh, so again, I'll, I'll uh, direct your attention to this trail right here where Officer Monet was standing. Uh, James Boyd's camp was up here. Officer Wetterland was kind of to the south, uh, north and west on the trail by this tree right here. Okay, and so close enough that if they needed a beanbag shotgun, uh, they could have asked him and he could have brought it up, is that right? If they would have asked him. Okay. Um, yesterday where I think we stopped was um, we were talking about Mr. Boyd's reactions to having the field officers pulled off and being replaced with the tactical team officers from the rope team um, and talked about his expressions. I think that's where we sort of stopped. Expressions of concern about his own safety. At this point, Judge, I would like to play excerpts from Exhibit 10. Um, uh, if we can have one. And um, uh, play some of those comments, Judge. That's a, a 10L, 10N is in Nancy, 10P is in Peter, 10R, and 10T is in Tom. Any objections? And can we put on the screen again, Judge? Oh, HDMI. Yes. Oh, HDMI. And just for the record, 10L is in Larry, N is in Nancy, P is in Peter, R is in Ralph, T is in Tom, are admitted without objection. All right, Judge. And um, Detective Stone, um, just so it's clear for the record, each of these things are, are happening at a different time. This, the, were these things happening all in a row, or were they happening at different times? Um, are, I'm sorry, which things are you referring to? <laughs> I'm sorry. It's the statements that he made expressing fear or concern in response to the arrival of the um, rope team and the tactical team. Um, yes. Uh, you know, I'm just going to object to the attorney testifying and characterizing statements. This, this, this in the case of the attorney should be commenting on the evidence. Let me, uh, would you like me to rephrase, Judge? Mm -hmm. All right. All of these statements were made after the tactical team arrived. Objection leading. Were these all these statements from Mr. Boyd made after the tactical team arrived? Um, the statements that you're about to play? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and play L. Well, and, and let me make sure it's clear. Were they made, uh, how were they made? Are these like a, 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 all in a row, these were all set at the same time, or were they set at various times during the? Uh, I believe they were set at various times. Okay. All right. So we can play L. Go back and think, but we didn't get the picture on that one. Okay, and you hear on that, Mr. Boyd, say, APD is standing by to kill me. Is that right? Uh, that's what it sounds like you're saying. Okay. We can play the next clip, which is uh, N. N? N, as in Ness? Our screen's not working, so I'm going to Okay, guys. All right, okay. It's There's, there's, hold on a second, we've got to get it fixed because there's something wrong. Can you stop it, Mike? Because we're cutting off, it's like cutting off the middle. Here, just, just stop it there for a second, Mike. It looks like we're missing, like it's moved over somehow. I don't know how that would be the source as opposed to the source and stuff. I don't, I, it's playing regularly on this, this computer. What I'll do is I'll turn it off and turn it back on and see. Okay. You and I have the same approach to technology. Your own approach doesn't work. At all. At all. Okay. Um, it's just not working. It's not working. 
is it, did it get disconnected or something simple like that? Oh, it's connected here, Your Honor. Just simply isn't turning on. It looks like plugged it in. Don't see why it wouldn't be working. But it's not just. Mr. Brayden, I don't want to delay things, so I'm just going to ask that you sit by Mr. Rubber so you can see that screen. My client, too? Sure. And uh, Sherry, will you call up Frank for himself and my team? Back to you, Becky. Yeah. We're just starting. Do you want to bring a chair up? I'm okay right now. Okay. Okay, Judge, this is clip um, 10N as in Nancy. This is the, that's the one that you did before, Mike. And then um, this is uh, clip number 10, P as in Peter. I'm going to leave, and I'm going to stay here and try to figure out what you need. Down there and talk to us. You don't try to stand me down there and talk. If I wanted to come down, I'd do it, but you start shooting at me. No, I wouldn't. And then uh, this is a ten R, Your Honor. in time. that this sort of ebbed and flowed, him expressing fear than threats. Uh, it would be attention to the leading form of the question and, putting fa and testifying on it. Um, in I'm going to overrule that objection okay. because she's bringing him back to an area of testimony from yesterday. Um, in order to be fair, what you would need to do is have the transcript and, and see when, during what times he was expressing fear and then what, during what times he was threatening. Is that right, sir? As far as if I'm going to testify to the exact times, yes. Right. And so um, we've asked you, we, we've gotten you the transcripts of the uh, Officer McDaniel's taser footage. McDaniel is the fellow who was the open space officer, is that right? Yes. And also the three transcripts from Scott Weimerskirch's three different tapes. Can you explain to the jury why there were three different tapes submitted by Officer Weimer Scourge? Um, so when they uh, upload the video from the officer's devices and it goes up into the, the cloud, so to speak, 
Um, when you pull it up, uh, pull up the actual videos to watch on um, on the server, it's broken up into, I believe, 30-minute segments. So even though the video is continuously running, the files are stored, uh, only have so much storage capacity. Uh, so it's not like he turned his camera on and turned it back, uh, or turned it off, turned it back on. It's just broken up into, into file segments. Okay, and so uh, let me hand you first um, Officer McDaniel's, uh, the transfer of Officer McDaniel's taser footage, which is uh, 8A. Can you identify that for me, please, sir? This appears to be the transcript. And I think it's just been stipulated evidence, Your Honor, 8A. Any objection to 8A? Yes? No. Okay. No objection. Okay. 8A um, is admitted. And, and uh, we ask you to review to see, well, first of all, were the fear statements highlighted in that on yellow? Um, yes. And the threat statements were highlighted in what color? Blue, I believe. All right. Did you go through to make sure that the, the highlighting had been accurate on that statement as to the fear statements and the threat statements? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, and then also for Officer Weimer's purchase, uh, uh, transcript of his uh, camp, um, 10U, uh, 10B, and 10W, did uh, you do the same thing? Yes, I did. And Your Honor, I move 10U, 10B, and 10W. Any objection? Can I just move? Sure. Okay. Your Honor, I, I, don't, I don't have a necessarily an objection, but I, I do have an objection to the prosecutor mischaracterizing that every threat has been highlighted, because that, that's not true. Um, with regard to the characterization of every threat being highlighted, I'll sustain that objection and admit 10 U, V as in Victor, and W. Okay, and so how can the jury use this to see um, both uh, fear statements and threat statements? Um. Well, again, it's going to be a transcript of the video of, of um, the, for when, uh, excuse me, um, when Officer McDaniel was on scene. Um, if you read the entire transcript, you're going to read um, basically every every statement that was picked up by James Boyd, whether it was a fear statement or when he was threatening officers. And that's going to be the same for uh, Officer Weimerskirch. Okay. Um. Let's go to the bottom of the hill when the um, rope team and the tack team arrived, and I think we had a picture of that yesterday. Actually, I think I need to admit a picture of that. Hold on one second. Let me hand you what's been marked uh, as State's Exhibit 32E4 and State's 7 c Seven. And um, do you recognize those photographs? Yes. Where? What is the source of those? Of uh, the first photograph, thirty-two A uh, four. Is it A four or E four? E four. I'm sorry, Judge. Thirty-two E four. 7C7. Seven seven. Uh, this was, um, I'm not exactly sure exactly where this photograph came from, but I um, believe it came from one of the civilians. Okay, that that's, would be Mr. Thixton maybe? I believe so, yes. Um, and what does 32E4 show? Uh, it's a still photograph from um, a taser camera. Okay. Um, and does it, oh, I'm sorry, I'm asking about this one still. Okay. Oh, okay. So, so what, does, what does it depict in the picture? Uh, you're, it's a picture of Detective Keith Sandy uh, looking through the optics on his rifle 
and standing next to him is SWAT officer McFarland. Okay. And this other photograph, 7C7, what source did that come from? Um, it came from a taser camera, and I don't recall whose taser camera it came from. Okay. Um, if we play the tape, will you be able to tell whose taser camera that came from? Uh, possibly. Okay. Your Honor, I move 32E4 and 7C7 into evidence. Any objection? No objection. No objection. Okay, if we can turn 7 and 32E4 are admitted without objection. Okay, if we can do the, the overhead again, Judge. And, and just so the jury, when they get these photographs, can figure out what photograph came from which, this one is sort of gold colored and this one is sort of blue cover, colored. What, what will that tell them about what the source uh, is of the particular photos they see? Um, the, to me, the, when you're taking a still photograph of the uh, taser footage from the actual officer's lapel video, um, it's of not great quality, a poor quality as when Mr. Thixton was taking higher quality photos. Okay. Um, so, the, so the gold, gold ones are, the, and the higher quality ones are from Mr. Thixton's camera? Yes. Um, and you were yes. talking to the jury about who, who is depicted in 32E4 down at the bottom of the hill. Can you point out for them what you uh, orally testified about? Yes. Uh, this is Detective Keith Sandy uh, looking through the uh, scope of his rifle, and this is SWAT officer uh, Jeff McFarland standing to his right. Okay. And this is after he's traded his, given his taser cam over to, to, to Detective Ingram and has taken up uh, his rifle. Is that right? Is uh, taser shotgun to detect finger. Okay. Um, this is the, what he's holding. Is that a taser shotgun that he's holding in that picture? What is he? What is he holding in that picture? Uh, his rifle. Is it a taser shotgun? No, it's not. Okay. Um, let me show you uh, State's Exhibit Seven, and this is from a taser cam. Um, and so, is there? Where would the person be who's taking this photograph? Uh, it's so the person is is standing right there. Okay, so can you put on your? Can you show me where the person is? Like, draw a little person where the person is standing. Um, that has the lapel camera on. Yes, sir. Well, they're standing. They're kind of standing behind them, so it's kind of hard to explain. The the, the image is coming from their collar. Coming from the coming from the collar of the officer who has the taser camera. Yes. Yeah. Questions. Where is the person who is taking this? Uh, this? They're standing standing right behind the uh, where the video is being taken. Who is depicted in this uh, video footage? Uh, this is going to be Detective Keith Sandy, and this is going to be Acting Sergeant Rink Ingram. And the more I look at it, I'm pretty sure this is coming from uh, K-9 Officer Scott Weimerskirch's video. Okay. Who were? Who was gathered at the bottom of the hill there? What officers were gathered at the bottom of the hill there? Um, again, uh, Keith Sandy, Rick Ingram, Officer Weimerskirch, uh, Jeff McFarland, um, for a time, Kenneth Ronzone, um, and uh, for a time, Officer Patrick Hernandez. Did they have any discussions at the bottom of the hill about a plan that they were going to come up with? So, 
so that we don't have to um, take a recess, do you mind just okay. taking the positions you had previously so that you and your client could view the screen? Can I proceed, Judge? Yes. Okay. Was there a discussion among these three people at the bottom of the hill that are depicted in this video um, about a plan? Yes. Um, and did you also, uh, when you were taking Defendant Sandy's statement, did you ask him um, uh, or talk to him about who came up with the plan? Um, I believe so. And, and what did he say about who came up with the plan? Um, I'd have to refer to the statement okay. I don't, if I'm going to be talking from it. Uh, 19 lines 23. Okay. Does that refresh, refresh your recollection about who he said came up with the plan? Yes. What did he say? Uh, in a statement, he said we came up with the plan. Okay. And by we, who was he talking about? Uh, K-9 Officer Weimer Skirch and Acting Sergeant Rick Ingram. And, and he. Okay. Okay. Um, Uh, you have also reviewed um, clips of this tape from, from um, uh, Cannon Officer Weimerskirch, have you not, sir? Yes. Um, and what I'd like to do, have you, have you listened to the tapes and compared the transcript on the tapes with the tapes themselves? Yes. Uh, and are the, is the transcript on the tape accurate with the tapes themselves? They appear to be. Okay. Your Honor, at this time, I would like to play... And let me get the exhibit number 10i, if I could. Any objection to 10i? No objection. Okay. 10i is And this is the tape at 706? I'm sorry, what was that? This is the tape at 706? Yes. Okay, right. We can switch it to the HDMI here. Oh, sorry. I, Mike, and then it's going to be 10J. Sorry, what was it? That, what 10 that? I is the first one that we're playing, Your Honor, oh. the, at the one at 706. Okay. Let's see if we get the image first, Mike, and then we can start it. turning around in that particular video? Uh, Detective Keith Sandy. Can you explain to the jury what a, what a jellyfish is and what that conversation was about? Um, it was about if the... Uh Sorry, I, I'm I sorry. will try to speak up. You oh, that's may sorry. proceed. <laughs> sorry, Judge. Okay. Can you explain what that conversation was about and what a jellyfish is? Um, it was if they utilized the taser shotgun and the probe or the projectile hit Mr. Boyd but did not affect him, um, if the dog was to go up and, and touch the probe, uh, the dog would not um, bite Mr. Boyd is what... Officer Scott Wimskirt was referring to. Okay, and the people who were there for that conversation, so it's very clear, uh, who, were the, who were the other two people 
people who were in on that conversation from the person that came their hand? Um, the other two people were Detective Keith Sandy and Acting Sergeant Rick Ingram, who had the taser shotgun. And that is Exhibit 32A and Exhibit 33A. Yes. And they were all within hearing distance to hear at 706 that, to hear that conversation. I'll rephrase, Judge. Were they, were they all within earshot? Uh, they appeared to be, yes. Okay. Um, and then was there another uh, conversation at 7.16 p.m. between uh, these three? Yes. Uh, and you have reviewed that conversation that was captured on the taser cam tape? Judge Foundation. Let me have counsel approved. Foundation for that one, Judge. I'm going to ask it in a non way, even though it's foundational. Um, although I've forgotten it, too, at this point, Judge. So let, let me gather myself again. Um, uh, have you reviewed this clip as well, sir? Yes. Uh, and have you reviewed it with the transcript that was prepared of the clip? Yes. And is it a fair and accurate transcript of what is actually said on this clip from... Um, uh, canine officer Weimer Skirch's taser cam. It appears to be yes. Okay. Your Honor, at this time I would play 7J. Uh, any, object yeah, any objection to 7J? No, Your Honor. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Judge, it's 10J. 10J. 10 10J. It's at 716, but it's 10J. <laughs> any objection to 10J? No objection. 10J is admitted. Nothing dynamic taking place. I don't think it really has much. The only goal we have is that that expert works, but it doesn't work, we put our hand. We got more tools coming at this point. So I think you here. Okay, can you explain uh, that what's heard on that particular tape? Um, again, it's Officer Wyman uh, talking about a plan. Um, he brings up, you'll, you'll notice though he uses the word X-Rep, uh, he's referring to the taser shotgun and again he's expressing concern that uh, uh, if it doesn't work um, then they may, the, the options may be more limited. Okay. And there's somebody on the tape who said we can do it. That's what it sounds like, yes. All right. And um, you, can you identify who that voice is? It sounded... Should I ask the state to lay a foundation? Sure. Um, how many times did you interview de 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 Defendant Sandy? Um, twice. Uh, how long was the first interview? Uh, it was over an hour. Um, and um, had you heard his voice in a professional setting when you worked with him or around him? Yes. Um, what did you do to try to identify whether this was Defendant Sandy's voice on the tape? I just listened to it. Okay, and, and how many times did you listen to it? Uh, quite a few times. Okay. Did you make an effort to try to be sure before, before you came in and testified whether this was Defendant Sandy's voice? Yes. Okay. 
And did you do anything else other than listen to this tape to try to determine whether it was Defendant Sandy's voice? I tried to listen to um, Acting Sergeant Rick Ingram's audio recording. Right. And can you explain how that was how that was being made? Um, he was record. Yeah, he had a like a digital recorder on his body that was recording the incident. And so in this picture. Um, can you show me where Rick Ingram is and, and, and where his tape would have been? And what exhibit number? This is exhibit, I'm sorry, Judge, 7C7. Uh, he had his recorder on uh, in front of him, standing next to Detective Sandy. Okay. And why did you listen to this tape in addition to listening to the tape of this person here? Because um, it was closer, so I was seeing if I could hear it clearer. On these, on these tapes, whose voice do you hear the best? Um, on, well, on... You can usually hear it better on the audio, except uh, on this time, it's you could only hear it really well on the taser camera. Okay. And, and I, I think my question, again, was not very good. When you were listening, when somebody has the, the camera on them and you're hearing a voice, whose voice is the loudest typically with whatever taser camera video you're listening to or, or uh, camera that you're listening to? Uh, whoever is the person that's wearing it. Right. That's their, their voice is the clearest. Okay, so so why did you listen to to um, Detective Ingram's audio as well? His the audio from him from him. Because he was closer to Detective Sandy. Okay, and were you able to hear him say something that you can't hear on the Weimer Scourge, uh tape? Uh, are you talking about the uh, acting sergeant Rick Ingram? Yes, sir. Uh, yes. What did he say? He said, uh, I believe he said, uh huh. All right, and and where was that uh huh placed? in the conversation that we heard, just heard on the tape? Uh, right after when um, Officer Sc uh, Scott Weimer Skirts talks about the x rep and all that. What does that tell you about whether the statement, we can do it, was made by um, Weimer Skirts, uh, Sandy, or Ingram? Well, um, based on that, that's why I believed it was Detective Sandy that said it. Okay. Um, and did you, did, hi did his voice on the that saying we can do it sounds similar to the voice of the man who you interviewed for an hour. Um, it did. Okay. Now, at the end of that conversation, um, what was the last statement in that conversation? Um, the, the last state. I'm sorry. Which part of it? I'm getting kind of confused could, now. Could we replay? Would it refresh your recollection to replay that statement? Sure. Okay. Okay. actually about two, both ends. At the beginning he says nothing dynamic is taking place. What What is that in reference to? Can, can you tell the jury who's, who the loud voice is on that taser cam? K-9 officer Scott Weimer Okay. Uh, what, what does that mean that nothing dynamic is taking place? Um, as, as to that particular statement, I don't know what he's meaning by that. Okay. And then at the end, he talks about less lethal in response to the we can do it comment. He says, we've got less lethal options coming. Let's see what's, what's coming up, something like that. What, what is your understanding of what the plan was at that particular point? Objection to the it's called for speculation, Your Honor. It's witness should speculate. Can I ask a question that is not speculation? Okay. Go ahead, Detective Stone. Um, again, uh, from that statement, I, I really didn't hear any type of plan being formulated. I mean, they're talking about options, but as far as a plan, um, there was none. Okay. Um, after this conversation at 716, who arrived at 720? I believe at 720 it was uh, Sergeant Jim Fox that got there. Okay. And did he arrive with any other SWAT officers? Um, eventually, Officer uh, Ramon Ornelas. Uh, who was the SWAT team leader, showed up. And then uh, at some point around that time, 7.20, around there, um, SWAT officer Dominique Perez. Let me hand you up to Marcus. Uh, States Exhibit 41A. Can you identify that, please? Yes, this is SWAT Sergeant uh, Jim Fox, and it's a frontal view of him being taken in the crime van. Okay. And what is 40A? A 40A is going to be a frontal picture in the crime van of SWAT team leader um, Ramon Ornales. Okay. 
Okay, Your Honor, I'd move 40A and 41A into evidence. And let me just clarify. So 41A is Sergeant Clark. Yes, Your Honor. Any objection to 41A and 40A? No objection. No objection. 40A and 41A are in evidence. Okay. And if we can switch this back on again, Judge, for the. Mm -hmm. Um, and who is that in 41A, Detective Stone? Uh, SWAT Sergeant uh, Jim Fox. Okay. And in 40A, who is that? SWAT Team, uh, team Leader Ramon Hernandez. And did these three officers, are, th these two officers arrive at, at approximately the same time as defendant? Approximately. Okay. And, Your Honor, I think we've already admitted into evidence the picture of Defendant Perez, which is 37A. distracted with the paper being moved here. Uh, can you repeat the question? Yes, sir. What, you talked about a little bit about what happens when SWAT shows up. Can you uh, talk about what the officers at the scene would understand the protocol was when SWAT Sergeant Fox showed up? Um, well, when he shows up on scene, uh, the what's generally known from the field officers is that uh, the uh, tactical officers and the tactical sergeant are going to start assuming responsibility for the scene. Um, now, it's important to know that that doesn't happen immediately. I mean, as soon as he's on scene, he's in charge. It's a, it's a process, but that will begin to start happening. All right. Uh, did you then take uh, statements from Defendant Sandy about the shooting itself? Yes. Um, uh, did you ask him what it looked like to him right before um, he shot Mr. Boyd? Um, yes. Uh, did he give you an answer? To, to well, let me, let me back up just a little bit. Did, did you speak to him about what it looked like to him when Mr. Boyd pulled his knives out? I'm sorry, who was he referring to? Uh, Defendant Sandy. Uh, yes. And did he give you a statement about what it looked like to him when Mr. Boyd pulled his knives out in response? He did give me a statement. Okay. And what, how did he describe the motion of Mr. Boyd in that statement? Um, again, I'd like to refer to the statement. Actually, Judge, I think we could come up and play. What might we get by these steps, maybe? Your Honor, I'd so we'll stipulate to the entire statement of Keith Sandy coming into evidence so that everybody can see it. Your Honor, and that's a speaking objection. Can we approach the bench on that, please? You may. 